Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this morning's Indopaycom J6 panel titled Information Warfare, Maximizing Cyber Capabilities and Effects Within All Domain Operations. Our moderator this morning is the perfect representative to lead this panel discussion, Major General Robert Skinner. He has led in the full spectrum of cyber and continues to find cyberspace operations today. Most recently, he was Commander 24th Air Force, Air Force Space Command, Commander Air Force Cyber, providing Air Force components and combatant commanders with trained, ready cyber forces which plan, direct, and execute global cyberspace operations. Today, Major General Skinner is the Director of Command and Control Communications Cyber for U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, Camp Smith, Hawaii. He's responsible for C4 across the largest regional combatant command and enabling joint coalition operations. He provides senior leadership and management in the Indo PACOM. It is my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Major General Skinner. Thank you. <laughs> so when I started off with uh, the discussion uh, with the SIF uh, earlier in the week, I, I said aloha, and I got a very tepid response. So, so let's see if we can do a little bit better. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Aloha. Excellent. And I, I know we're kind of the, the bookend. I, I know there's a, a speaker at lunch today, uh, the deputy commander of PAC fleet. Um, and so we're kind of the bookend from a panel standpoint. And so it, it, it's our honor to, to be here before you to kind of talk about um, information warfare um, and in all domain operations and, and uh, how cyber effects uh, can support that uh, as well as the, the all domain operations. Uh, I will tell you there's no question that's off limits. Um, as we kind of walk through there, there may be some questions that we have to tepidly walk through uh, based on classification or, or, or based on other things, but uh, we, we will try and get to all the, all the questions. Um, we have a great panel in, in front of you, uh, from my standpoint. Um, these are representatives of the six community from the component standpoint across the board. Um, I, I think Mr. Stevenson needs no introduction um, as the N6 for, for, for PAC fleet. Um, as everyone knows, he's actively engaged, um, never at a loss for words. Um, and I think he's got some great insights that, that, that he, he will provide today from a PAC fleet standpoint. And it's also leading the theater in, in, in a lot of different areas. We also have Colonel Lisa Whitaker, um, who those who knew her from before was the DISA Global Commander. Um, and now she's the Deputy G6 for user PAC. Um, a lot of great insights and, and a lot of great things from across the board in, in all of her previous um, assignments. And then we have Colonel Roy Rockwell, who's uh, uh, the, I'll say the Deputy A6 out at the, the Deputy to the Deputy of the A36 uh, at uh, PACAF. <laughs> Air Force always has to be more difficult than the rest of the, uh, the, the rest of the services. But he, he brings a wealth of knowledge, um, soon to be a group commander um, the, the, this summer, so um, he's got a lot, a, a lot of insights. And then we have Colonel Joe Delaney, uh, the, the Marine Corps, although it's, he's the Information Environment Directorate, um, used to be the, the G6, but now they've combined a lot of the information warfare um, entities and mission sets underneath that. So I think we have a, a great panel uh, here before you. What we'll do is we, we have a, a few questions that we will uh, offer up to, to the panel members to get the juices flowing um, from a understanding standpoint and some things that they wanna, wanna discuss, and then we'll, we'll open up for questions. The, those who heard uh, heard me talk a little bit earlier at the SIF, and those who heard Admiral Davison talk, um, I will tell you this is a very challenging but opportunistic time in the in the Indo-Pacific theater. Um, and those who and I understand that the National Defense Strategy is a couple years old now, but it is at the heart of everything that we are doing in the Indo-Pacific theater. And while the NDS is a two plus three, uh, I would offer there's a even within the two there's a there's a higher two, and, there's, and then there's a, a, a medium two, and the higher two is, is the threats that, that we face here in the Indo-Pacific theater. Um, and if you look at what Admiral Davison talked about of the things that he's focused on in trying to regain the advantage within the theater, communications, cyber, information warfare, and non-kinetic effects are at the heart of everything that we are having to do and that we want to do uh, <laughs> in this theater. So it's a very challenging time, but also it's a very opportunistic time as, as we move forward. And then you add in um, the, the big difference from my standpoint from the Pacific theater, from the European theater is Europe has NATO, right? They have a coalition that is of, of 20 plus nations already formed. Um, 
in this theater, there's a lot of bilaterals, there's trilaterals, um, five eye support, uh, but it is much more complex uh, in, in my eyes and something that, uh, that just adds to the challenge and adds to the complexity of the things that, that, that we have to face. Um, information security, cybersecurity uh, is very important, not only from the aspect of, uh, of our, our mission sets, but just as important is we see the newspapers, we see that one of the biggest ways that other, other nations and adversaries try and get a leg up from a research and development standpoint is the, is the theft of intellectual property. Um, and that is at the heart of things that we do to now and things that we do in the future because the more that that, 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 that property is, is stolen, um, the more that they can come close to the, the competitive advantages that, that, that we have today. And that's, that's something that, uh, that is at the heart of information technology because from an industry standpoint, um, we've, we've continued to show that from a United States standpoint that uh, our innovation is, is second to none. Um, and so being able to protect that, not only from a U.S. standpoint, but from a coalition standpoint is, is very important um, because one of the things that we have to be able to do in any mission that we have in the future is partnerships and sharing of information. Um, and if that information is not secure, then that puts the whole, the whole mission and the, and the strategic risk at, at a very high level. Interoperability. Uh, General Shea and I were talking a little bit earlier um, when he was the, the J6, just a couple years ago. And interoperability was a key <coughs> component and a key uh, mission set that he, he continued to try and focus on. Uh, it's the same today. Um, how do we maintain interoperability? How do we leverage technology to make sure that we have in a contested environment, in a disadvantaged environment, in an HADR environment, in a when before fighting in a, in a conflict, how do we make sure that we are able to bring all this, the data together, all the infrastructure together to make sure that we can, at the time and place of our choosing, we can connect, share, and learn with our allies and with our joint partners uh, across the board. Th those are just some of the things that, uh, that are at the top of our plate as we kind of continue moving forward with how do we regain the advantage in the, in the Indo-Pacific theater. So with that, I will ask some questions from our from our, our other panel members to get some things rolling, and then uh, we'll, we'll we'll take your questions. So first, we'll start off with Mr. Stevenson, and is what is Pacific Fleet's point of view regarding all domain operations? Well, thank you, sir. That's a I, I would say that's a topic that's foremost in our minds. Um, we're um, we're on a a, a path uh, as the maritime component commander here to. Um, Use a, a use a process that was uh, started by uh, the Navy in the Pacific in the 20s and 30s, when the U.S. Pacific Fleet then realized that it might uh, face a conflict um, with a, a capable peer in the Western Pacific, and they were uh, exposed to a, a bunch of new capabilities: um, aircraft carriers, submarines, radios, and they had to figure out how to do that. So. Uh, it started out with a, a series of war games at the Naval War College. It led to what was called fleet battle problems. And there were about 20 of them conducted uh, through the uh, spring of 1941. Fleet battle problem 22 was supposed to happen in the spring of 1942. It was canceled for obvious reasons. Admiral Swift started us up on that path again a couple years ago. Uh, we also started going to the Naval War College. Uh, the CNO gave the Global War Game Series to us, uh, to the Navy, to figure out how, uh, how we might uh, do that in the modern era. Uh, I participated in about eight of the games. I, I, will, I will tell you uh, without reservation that, that if there is a next fight, it will, be, it will, be, it will begin and, and will be won in space and cyber, flat out. So. Um, if you look at, uh, if, you know, fighting with our, along with our uh, joint brothers and sisters and our coalition partners in the area. So uh, it's going to be a very, uh, very complex and potentially a very fast conflict should it occur. And, and I think we've determined at the center of that is the need for an all-domain battle management system. Uh, you know, all-domain has different meanings to different people, uh, much like the word secure. I'm sure you've all heard the joke. You tell a Navy guy to secure the building, he shuts the door. You tell a Marine to secure the building, he 
establishes a perimeter with armed guards. You tell an Air Force guy he gets a 20-year lease. But, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, really, I thought you guys all heard that. Um, but really, all, all domain to, to our, my commander means, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to fight in cyber, in space, uh, on the sea, below the sea, on the earth, on the ground, and so on. And, and to, to us, it means we're going to fight in all security domains, from secret rail to, to higher, than, higher than TS. And, and so we need, we need to figure out how we're going to do that. And we're going to need to figure out how to do that in a contestant environment. So the Air Force's initiative, of which we are a, a strong supporter, strongest supporter, uh, we think is we think is, is is exactly the right thing at the right time. Um, we are participating through our digital warfare office. Uh, there's a there's a, a war game the, their next war game at Nellis. You've all probably heard about the Shadow Ops Center. Uh, our, we've been participating in that, uh, and uh, I, I think I'm going to the game to the next game in the spring if we can if we can make that happen. But it, it's essential that we have to do that. And it's a complex problem, and it. it Modern technology comes along at a perfect time. We are going to need to leverage the power of modern compute and artificial intelligence to be able to operate at the speed we need to operate, to, to take, in, uh, take into consideration all the complex factors and operate. We are going potentially against a, an adversary who's already deep in, in, in artificial intelligence. We know this. So how we do this, it's, it's absolutely the right thing at the right time. We're partnered, all the components here along with, with Indopaycom, are partnered in an effort to get to um, a joint force which is going to be enabled by these technologies. Okay, thank you. Uh, so for, for Colonel Whitaker, um, as we know today, we're in a strategic power competition, right? That there is, uh, some would say we're in phase zero in cyber uh, to today, and we have been for a while. Uh, what is the Army doing from a six perspective to effectively meet the demands of a new era of great power competition as part of an interdependent multinational force of the future? Thank you, sir. So I think the, the Army recognizes the need for interoperability in terms of um, working together with our joint and multinational <coughs> partners. And we also recognize that uh, we have, we're, we're challenged in terms of our ability to rapidly and routinely uh, share information uh, with our partners for secret releasable information. And so to address that problem, we've actually used our, um, our allies and we've established some rigor in terms of implementing um, the ability to share information during our joint warfighter assessments and also our core warfighting exercises in order to uh, use those, those opportunities to, to share information and build synergies in terms of uh, providing the insights necessary uh, for us to operate effectively and rapidly um, in, those, in those exercises with our joint partners. And so we're really gonna continue to focus on a mission partner environment that permits uh, the sharing, the information sharing as needed. And certainly that presents a challenge because when you have multinational partners, the different information sharing requirements differ from one partner <coughs> to the next, oftentimes in the same space. And so we have to continually work through that. And I really think uh, moving forward that we'll, we'll mature in that area uh, through a mission partner environment that, that provides the, the, the various information sharing um, initiatives and, and constraints per, per partner that we're engaged in at the same time. Okay. As, as uh, Admiral Davison mentioned uh, in his discussions and as we've talked before, you know, that, uh, and even as Mr. Stevenson mentioned earlier, the, the next phases of, of the future, um, it's all gonna be about the components and how the components are able to be interoperable and how they're able to work together in, in all domains as well as then branching out to our partners fr from a coalition standpoint. So Colonel Rockwell, outside of leasing that Mr. Stevenson mentioned, <laughs> what's the one thing you would look to improve with regards to warfighting capability between the components in the Pacific AOR? Well, sir, <clears throat> thanks, thanks for that question. It's great to see so many of our partners out there that we've been working with over the past year. Mr. Stevenson and I have had many talks along with uh, my friend here, Joe, about what, what can we do to get after consolidating our data. And it's all about the data, right, and, and access to the data and delivering. So how do we deliver a single warfighting framework that includes data from all the services and partners and then give people access by the level of access they have? So multi-level security. How do we build secure containers inside a hybrid cloud environment? 
get away from network-based security and more into cloud-based and data-based uh, security. So if I, if I could do one thing to make things more interoperable, it would be building that framework so that all the services can bring their data into a single repository where everyone has access to it. Okay. Joe, what, what do you see as the greatest impediment to transitioning to all domain operations? <clears throat> Good morning and thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you everyone for being here. It's a great honor to see you all again. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being the AOR for almost four years now. The greatest impediment to all domain operations, if I had to take one answer to that, I would, I would say the understanding of the information environment. <clears throat> as, uh, as the J6 alluded to in the opening, the Marine Corps has dramatically changed the way we, we operate the way we're going to fight into the future. Uh, we began here in the Pacific AOR with the formation of the information environment. You see that now at the tactical level with our MEF information groups. For those of you who are familiar with the Marine Corps, once upon a time, those were the MEF headquarters groups. They're very administrative, command by nature, and now they're very operational. And what they've done is they've combined all elements of the information domain in one tactical command. We've also done that at Mall 4 PAC with the information environment, and we've also done that at Headquarters Marine Corps with uh, what we're now calling the Deputy Commandant for Information. Just to elaborate slightly, if you're not familiar with the information environment, I would encourage you to definitely start reading more about the information domain, because that is the direction that we are going. On one side of that information environment, you have everything that most of you all are familiar with and the technologies that you provide everything from cyber to traditional C4, space, MSO, electronic magnetic spectrum operations, and then you also have electronic uh, warfare. On the right side of that, you have something that we neglect talking about in this room quite, bit, quite a bit that really takes us down the road of perception management. It's the strategic messaging. It's the military deception. It's the key leader engagements. <clears throat> everything that ties into that. So when you look at one of the challenges with all domain operations, it's the fact that we don't integrate all those functions together. The Marine Corps is beginning to do that now, and I believe we're on the right path. We're seeing that with our Five Eye partners. I was in Australia about a few, a few weeks ago. Uh, I saw some Australians, uh, the Australian Defense Force, walking the ground uh, throughout the last three days. I was really happy to see them. But, it, but I'll elaborate a little bit more with some of the other questions and discussions. But right now, sir, I would say the biggest impediment to all domain operations is not understanding the entire information domain that affects all those operations. Okay, thank you. Mr. Stevenson, since, since you've been in the, in the theater for a short time, <laughs> what do you see as the greatest impediment to transitioning to all domain operations? Well, thanks, sir. I was just trying to calculate, see what's today, Thursday, about 45 years. So, um, uh, I... <laughs> Thanks, thanks. Um, better to be lucky than to be good, I suppose. Uh, I, I think um, it's a serious topic because um, I, I think our, I think our, our biggest our biggest challenge is, is has to do with the speed, the speed of acquisition, and, and it's, it's a recurring topic at forums like these, and it, it's uh, it, it is a challenge because. Um, a lot of the basis of it is in law, and one of my mentors uh, said, you know, policy can be changed, the law cannot, including physics. Um, so, I, I, but I think, I think we've, uh, despite the best efforts of many well-intended people, we're not where we need to be in terms of that. And, I, and I'd, like to, I'd like to talk about an issue that comes with scale. So, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, we, we actually operate the Pacific Fleet with about 40 people. In, you know, if you look at who's in our three centers, about the number of people we have on watch, in in time of in times of crisis, that could go up by by a couple orders of magnitude. So I'd have to go from my 40-person land to about a 4,000-person land just in our head just in our headquarters, and 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 then I have additional uh, task forces I have to look after, and so again, technology provides us with the opportunity of. of, of scaling, but acquisition makes it hard. We basically have to go buy it. And, and I'll give you an idea of the speed of technology. We've been, we've been working on a concept called adaptive force package. The idea is that we have to go command and co command, exercise command and control or logistics or targeting 
in non-traditional locations. We might have to leave our, you know, we might have to leave our headquarters and go aboard a ship, or go to a, an austere base somewhere in the Pacific, or hopefully a, a, at least a building, a base that has buildings on it. Um, I, I need to be able to do that in a hurry, and I, I, I can't, I can't go, I can't afford to buy the uh, the equipment to be able to do that. More challenging still is is maintaining it. Uh, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna defend this equipment against a cyber threat, we have to be on it constantly. What, what the model I'm looking for in the adaptive force package I'm trying to work out with, uh, with my um, colleagues here is to have a way that we can partner with you, industry, to say, let's take advantage of the cloud. Let's, let's build and maintain our capabilities in the cloud at the time and place of our choosing, be able to go instantiate it where we need it. Um, and and part, so that's, uh, I, I think that's something that's, that's quite viable. The, the technology is there. We, there have been some Fantastic advances. We went, um, we built the adaptive force package. We, we turned USS uh, Somerset, which is an amphibious assault ship, very capable platform, but not configured for command and control. We made it the headquarters for Third Fleet uh, for the last uh, Talisman Saber exercise. Now, what's relevant about that, not only did we put that capability on there, but we did it in the security enclave that the commander needed. This was a coalition exercise. Uh, Vice Admiral Alexander was the Coalition Task Force Maritime Component Commander, so we were able to instantiate it in the security domain that he needed to be. Um, State-of-the-art technology uh, worked with our, our, uh, our, our systems command, um, who's been, being really innovative. Um, and uh, it was about, it supported about 100 people. So I've got an exercise coming up early next year. It's gonna be in a different security enclave, and it's gonna be, it's gonna be about uh, eight times bigger than what we put on Somerset, enabled by technology that's evolved within that period of time. So we collectively need to work together to figure out how we can leverage leverage the great work that's being done in this country. I had the opportunity with uh, uh, Colonel Chad Lemire and um, Joe's uh, deputy to, to go visit SpaceX. I mean, that was uplifting. If, if I was 22 years old, not married, and a mechanical engineer, I'd go to work there. It was amazing to see what those Americans are doing. I mean, that, that, it, it was, I mean, it, on, despite all the capability, it, it's just amazing to see what the Amer what Americans can still do uh, to, to create a product and, and build something that's, that's really a marvel and, and to do it at scale. So we want to harness that power. We're going to need to harness that power in the fight, and we have to figure out how to do it. The last piece is security accreditation. I mean, I, I'm not going to rant about RMF. Uh, my staff made me promise not to do that. But RMF is a great process, but we have to, we have to, we have to implement it more. We have to be more um, agile in the way we implement it. You know, I, I met with Admiral Norton this morning. I told her we ought to, you know, there's thousands, there are about, about 1,300 controls. I don't know what, what they are lately. but. Um, we ought to inherit a bunch of that just for the, just for being on the Doden network. The Doden network is a powerful tool. It's got a lot of capacity. You ought to get some credit for that. You ought to get some credit for the fact that you've configured your machine in accordance with the DISM, with the STIGs. The rest ought to be just, you know, fill in your name here uh, and go off and, and, and put all the effort that we're putting into to generating paperwork into continuous monitoring. Because we need to be able, we need to be able to protect it kind of circle back to the scaling thing, but the scaling thing is important because you can't attack something that's not there. So if, if my, if my multi-domain network is, is resident in a very small instance in the cloud and we instantiate, we can instantiate it reliably in times of crisis, you know, it, it's going to take, you know, and it, it's going to take an adversary some time to figure out what it is and how to get at it. And the, the most important part about this is doing that in a way that our, our, our users can, can sit down, plug in their credentials, and, and go to work. And I think one of the, one of the things uh, I'm working with, with Colonel Rockwell and, and, and Colonel Whitaker and everybody else is getting to a point where it's the same toolkit, so like I said, it's, it, becomes a, it becomes a plug and play thing. Because um, as, as we stand up, we have this thing called a joint manning document. Uh, we, we all we all give to it and we all use it and we need we need to train our work fighters to do it and we can't we won't have the time in a future conflict 
to train them in, in unique capability, service unique capabilities. So uh, I think these are all things, none of these are, none of these are laws of physics and none of these violate public law. I think it's just, it's just all of us working together to, to, to leverage the amazing technology that's coming out of the United States to, uh, to help us contribute to this fight. Okay, thank you. A lot of, a lot of challenges that, uh, that I know that uh, from a joint standpoint we're all, we're all trying to work through. Um, Lisa, from an all-domain or multi-domain perspective, what are some of the enduring challenges the Army is still trying to work out? And do you think some of your challenges are also joint challenges? Yes, sir, thank you. So I think the, the enduring theme is how do we enable convergence? And so at the end of the day, we had, you could argue that we had multi-domain when we had airland battle. Philosophically, it's more than one domain uh, at, at the time. But under all domain operations, now we have, we're implementing and we want to converge synergies across all the domains from space, uh, cyber, air, air land, et cetera. So you just want to maintain this convergence. And what we found is that um, there's always, there's a technical solution. We've been partnering with industry and certainly I, I do believe that there are multiple opportunities for us to take advantage of. But at the end of the day, we, they also have to be policy compliant as well. And, and so what we're doing is we're continuing to partner with industry, but not only do we need the convergence of uh, enabling a capability across multi-domains, uh, across all domains, but at the same time, we need the ability to share that information with our, with our multinational partners. And so it's not a U.S.-specific problem, sir, and it's certainly um, not just a service-specific, so it's actually joint as well because we also want to be able to take advantage of our multinational partners' abilities to provide um, the same synergy, to link the sensor data to the C2 node to the shooter in a timely, relevant, relevant manner and take advantage of not only U.S. abilities to perform that, that task well, but also to, to leverage our multinational part partners' ability to perform the same convergence in the regional, against a regional threat. And so I think, sir, moving forward, that we definitely want to have a common definition and have a joint uh, all-domain um, C2 uh, con ops in place for us to kind of take advantage of that. Because moving forward, we will always fight, I would argue, um, in a joint environment. And so we just need to consider that and in, in how do we leverage the capabilities of our multinational partners at the same time. Okay. Rocky, you know, there's, there's an ongoing debate, right? The, the, the debate is, What's more important, the network or the data? Um, previously, the debate probably was more in line with uh, significantly more on the network because it was all about the network and, and the network capabilities and what the network can support. Um, that debate, I think the conversation is changing a little bit to understand uh, is the data more important than the, 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 the network? And so, Rocky, from your standpoint, why is data and data analytics so important for warfighting capabilities today and into the future? Sir, uh, the bottom line up front is data is all about improving warfighting decision making, right? If we can bring the data together from each of the services to improve warfighting decision making, if I can give my TJ FAC improved decision operation capability, when he, where he can, he uses the example of Uber, right? How does he take and identify where his aircraft are, when they're there, and what, what, what capabilities he's ha he has available on those aircraft? And Uber gives you, you know, it's a, it's a good example of how, um, you know, he can you can identify vehicles, types of vehicles, and all that uh, within the app. And so how do we build capability like that um, in order to deliver uh, multi-domain operations? It, it, when, you, when you think about the sports uh, environment, right, uh, football, baseball, they're all using data to make themselves better, to fine-tune those little things to be more efficient and to be better and we don't do that very well we're we're concerned about securing you know this this workstation well I, I shouldn't be as concerned about securing this workstation as I should be about the data that's on it and I'm not talking about necessarily locking it down what I'm talking about is how do I push data to the edge zipper data secret data to the edge for the warfighter to get the ATO what technologies are out there uh, AFRLs de developed a capability called SecureView, and it allows me to push a secret image across a Nipper net uh, network. 
How do I push that to the end so that I can push the ATO to my warfighters? How do I push it back so that the AOC can have coverage of where all the, all the battle is going on and what, what assets are available? Ultimately, at the end of the day, we seek superiority of information, supremacy and in decision accuracy and the ability to use big data as our asymmetric advantage on the battlefield and through the range of military operations. Start by leveraging industry best practices, which many of you vendors here are, um, are those, you, you're bringing those industry best practices, but how do we bring, sorry, how do we bring them together then um, and leverage that without buying the same thing over and over again and not moving forward? So how do we take machine learning and, and at a minimum and, uh, and make, make and improve that warfighter's decision making? Okay. It, Joe, we, we, we've talked a lot about, about technology and, and, and what industry can do, and, and, and just for all the panel members, the, the, on, on the closing comments, what I would offer, what I'd ask you to do is cover uh, what, if there was one thing that you really want from industry um, and industry support, what, what, what would that be? Only one thing? Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, just one thing to start with. If, if you give them too much, then they'll go. Um, but Joe, from a, uh, to, to go a little bit away from, from the technology aspect, you know, warfighting concepts come and go. Um, what do you think about replacing the current warfighting concepts with the all domain operations concept? Yes, yes, the, um, the all domain concept is really, to, to me, you have to understand the way I think, but to me, the all domain concept is a rallying point. It's a shift in the mindset. It gets people to think across the entire spectrum of warfare. It, it's very similar to what I talked about with the information domain. The Marine Corps has had a single battle concept for years. And in that single battle concept, we really emphasize the fact that the battlefield is not indivisible. You, you, don't, you don't look at the battlefield and you don't separate the sea, air, and land. So when cyberspace came around, that was natural. We, we realized that any effect in one element of the battle space affects all elements of the battle space. So when you think about all the main operations, you take things up a level from the service, from the component level, up to the joint level operating in the joint operation environment, uh, and you immediately start to think, what, what does this actually mean? Well, now you need to think across the entire information domain, across all domains, all domain operations, and it begins to shift your mindset. Um, so, so yes, I do think we need that new concept because you need, you need war fighters, you need planners, you need industry, you need everyone to stop and think, what does this actually mean? With that, uh, I do want to tie in, I'm going to say one of my comments for later since I can only uh, address one thing at a time. But uh, if, if you're doing work with the Marine Corps, if you're thinking about all the main operations, the Marine Corps is going through a, a significant shift right now. We just had our 38th Commandant take, take the round, take command, and right off the bat, he publishes planning guidance. If you were to go to your phone, go to your computer, whatever, you, if you type Commandant planning guidance, Commandant guidance, this is what comes up at the top. Right up front, it's only about 20 pages. It's Marine speak, real simple. And it, it's straightforward. We tell you what we want. It's a 25-year plan, which a lot of people look at a 25-year plan and they don't put a lot of value into that. It's too far out. Uh, right up front, there's five lines of effort listed in there. The two lines of effort that I would love industry to really take a look at is the first two. Number one is uh, force design. The Marine Corps is making radical changes. Even though it's a 25-year plan, some of those changes will take effect in the next three years. The one that I need industry to really look at in there, right underneath force design, the second one is war fighting, but the one on the force design is naval integration. Myself and um, Bob Stevenson down there, we are tied to the hip on all efforts going forward, and we are tackling problems that the Marine Corps has been challenged with for decades now under naval integration. So take a look at some of the challenges. How do we do shipboard communication? We are divesting ourselves of some major capabilities that will shock you. And if I get a chance, I'll mention a, a couple of them. And we are investing very rapidly in others. So we're doing some very quick innovation. Uh, Mr. Stevenson mentioned acquisition, uh, RMF process. I will not talk about RMF. Uh, I can with my DISA hat back on. But, um, but I would challenge you to look at that naval integration very closely and see how you can meet some of the challenges that the Navy and the Marine Corps are facing. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. I think it's time to open up to, to questions to the audience and see what's, uh, what's on your mind. I think we've covered a lot of, of different topics up here that uh, hopefully whetted the appetites um, from acquisition, 
We talked a little bit about personnel. There's training, there's force design, force development. Um, it runs the gamut. Partnerships, all those things are very important at the end of the day to, to make sure that we have uh, the right force at the right time to, to be successful. But thank you to the panel. Uh, the first question is, in a high tempo, all domain environment, the network availability, management, and capacity seems to be a given. Are you concerned that it is being taken for granted? Sure, I'll take it. Sir, I would say no. I would say that uh, for us, we anticipate degradation. We, we expect it. And so and in terms of our planning, we know that uh, network availability is key to success. And so what we do is we plan across multiple levels of access so that uh, we will potentially operate and fully expect to operate in a degraded environment, but I don't think that anyone walks out the gate and, and fully expects full access the way that we enjoy it in our day-to-day -day workspaces. And so what we do is, you know, the term is typically PACE, but we actually plan according to multiple uh, manners to uh, to achieve the, the mission command required in support of the commander. So uh, I, I, we're not concerned that it's taken for granted because I think overall in our com community, it's expected to have experienced degradation. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like to uh, just affirm what, what Lisa said to the point where, um, you know, we, we, say, we, we say at our, in our command that if, if my boss is interested, I'm fascinated. Our whole, our whole construct of uh, resilient command and control was developed by Admiral Aquilino when he was our director of maritime operations. So uh, to that end, um, we, we absolutely expect it's gonna, gonna happen. We, uh, we practice it routinely, um, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. Um, the, for example, the um, not wanting to editorialize on the source of climate change, but we are seeing an increase of, the, of large storm systems in the Pacific AOR. Um, about half of them seem to be bore sighted on the island of Okinawa, where one of our major DISA gateways is located. And so we, we, routine, we routinely practice moving things, uh, moving stuff around. We, uh, I just uh, uh, sent an order uh, earlier this uh, month to my number of fleet commanders that lays out a, a, our plan for the year of how we want them to exercise to, to do the reps and sets necessary so that the crews are trained. Uh, it, it's, it's, a work, it's a work in progress that we have to, we all recognize that we're going to have to do that, we're going to have to be ready, we, have to, we are going to have to practice operating in an environment where communications are going to be degraded or denied and we're making it our business to, to become uh, excellent at it. I'll, I'll take a different view. Um, I, I'll say, if you'd asked me a few years ago, it, um, I wouldn't have been concerned. I think the magnitude of the disruption and the potential magnitude of the degradation, I'm not certain we're actually exercising to that level. Um, Pockets we are, I think. Um, I think from a joint standpoint and from a coalition standpoint, I think there, there's some work to do. Um, if you look at, at the PACE plans, um, unfortunately some of the PACE plans that you look at aren't spelled P-A-C-E, they're spelled P-P-P-P because it's all focused on the primary. Um, and I think that's, that's, I think would be a great, uh, a great avenue for industry support and help is how do you make sure that, from a, that, that the P and the A are resilient? that they are available at the time and place of our choosing, not necessarily every single, you know, 24 by seven, you know, five, nine, six nines, but at the time and place of our choosing, that based on what the adversaries potentially could do, that, uh, that, that we have that infrastructure in place, that we have the data in the right places, uh, and we have all of the platforms that are able to, to, to leverage the infrastructure that we have in order to, to be successful. So th that's my concern. Uh, coming in, in the theater is to make sure that we have that from a joint standpoint and from a coalition standpoint. Again, I think we have some, some good pockets. Um, I think the exercises today are much better than they were a few years ago, but I think the magnitude of, of what the adversaries could potentially do, I think is, is something that we need to continue working, working towards. Next question is, uh, 
What is preventing the multinational information sharing program being resourced, governed, and led to precisely address Indo-PACOM coalition warfighting requirements? So I, the person who's been on the, on, the, on the island 30 days, I'll take this one to start with, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to, to, to the experts over here. Um, I, I think a lot of the discussion on the uh, MNIS and MPE and other things is a true understanding of the power of what those programs can bring and what, the, the, what those programs can bring to the all-domain fight. And I think that's part of it. There's a strategic messaging piece of this. Um, those who are in the in the CIF, uh, from a resourcing standpoint, um, I'll tell you the there is significant resourcing. Um, finding that that resourcing and making it, it available for for programs like this, it's all about how can you defend it and how can you understand and relate that to the all-domain operation. So I think that's the thing that's holding us back from a uh, from a multi-domain standpoint and from a an understand from a sharing of information and the interoperability is. How do we make sure that we, in all of the right forums, that the senior leaders, the mid-level leaders, the action officers, the working groups, everyone is aligned and synced with the power of what that, of what that can bring? I will tell you, those who've been in the building uh, and, and those who've seen programmers, um, programmers, all they have is a hatchet and a sword. Um, and their goal is they've been put into an untenable task of finding enough resources for every single mission and every single capability that, that is required. Um, and so their, their goal is to, if you don't have a coherent message and you don't have an aligned and synchronized message, any, any kink in that armor, uh, they, will, they will take advantage of and cut. That's just, that, that, that's just the position that, that, that they're in. It's not right or wrong, it's just that's what it is. And so I think the messaging piece of this and understanding and making sure that those in the leadership positions, the combatant commanders, the service chiefs, and others truly understand that because that's where, um, where you'll get the, the direction to continue to improve it. So anyone else wanna? Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, and I, I think um, I agree with everything uh, General Skinner says, and, and I think that it, it, it is about messaging because um, you know, if you, look back, if you look back in history in the last 150 years, I think the United States has been in a, in a, in a, in a conflict where it's fought unilaterally, I think it was twice. Once was Grenada and once was the Spanish-American War. Everything else we fought as a part of a coalition. And, and I, I, think, I think recently, up, up, until, up until very recently, coalition operations was, was more of a performance than a practice. We would get together, like in the case of the Navy, we would get together every two years. We'd throw RIMPAC, largest maritime uh, naval op exercise in the world, multiple partner nations, uh, you know, been um, amazing progress has been made on all fronts. We have a big cocktail party and we go home for two years. Um, and the parties are wonderful, by the way. Um, I, I think, I think, Fast forward to today where co-deployments is now, it, it, coalition operations have gone from a performance to a practice. We do it every day. Um, we are operating with uh, several other nations enforcing United Security Council resolution sanctions in the Western Pacific. Um, we are adding new, we are bringing in new partner nations all the time, uh, specifically India. Uh, India is an example of that. I, I think, a lot of that, a lot of it has to do with it. It falls on us to message this: is that we intend, we intend to fight in a coalition environment. It's going to be a high-end fight. Uh, a lot of our partners in this theater bring significant combat power and more fighting skill, and we're going to need it. Uh, it's just a matter of us, us doing it. Uh, I, th I think work, work to do on all fronts. The programmers have difficult decisions. Uh, uh, I'm good friends with Claude Barron, who's my, who's my, uh, my resource sponsor. I, I sympathize him with him every time because he, he has to make King Solomon-like decisions almost every day, and we try and, we, we try and arm him with that. They are, very, they are very focused, but we have to continue to make that focus. I think uh, a lot of progress has been made and is going to be made in coming years as, as we do that. And we'll, but it's gonna take steady pressure and not pressure so much is to tell the story correctly. 
is to, is, is to make sure everybody understands the, how much we're going to rely on the capability, how much we rely on it every day, and in times of crisis, how much we're going to really going to need it. I, I do want to emphasize that for, for industry, you all are doing a phenomenal job in this area. I, I want this from the Marine Corps side. I want this from the DISA side. I mean, it's, it's not a technology problem. It really is a messaging. It's not, we don't need cross, more cross-domain solutions. We don't need more multi-enclave clients. I mean, you can keep fine-tuning your products, but really, you, you all have done your job. It's really up to us that, that are wearing the uniform and serving as civilian, civilian uh, government employees. We really got to fine-tune our messaging. We got to work behind the scenes, and we got to get better at working together, not only among the service components, but also at the joint level and with our mission partners. Uh, I mean, just working with the Five Eye partners is challenging, and then you start bringing in the other nations. But we have a lot of work to do in this area, so thank you for your technological solutions. Keep doing what you're doing, but it's not really, the, the problem is not with your products. I've seen amazing products just in the last couple of days on the floor, and if any of you all talked to me individually, you saw how visibly impressed I was, and I'm not easily impressed with technology. I'm not a bright, shiny object type of guy. But I mean, there's some really cool stuff you have out there on the floor. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep fine-tuning it. But we got to really work behind the scenes with the policy side and the relationship side. Can I add one thing, sir? So, so I'll go back and I'll footstop it. To me, it's not about the networks, the multinational information system networks delivering across different networks. It's about the data and delivering the data at the multi-level security and coalition levels. Uh, in the right way. We've got to rethink about this problem and stop thinking about it in the same old mindset where we've thought about delivering a network for each different coalition capability. Let's put the data in a secure container in the cloud somewhere and give those folks access to it when they have the ability to get access to it, the classification level to get access to it. The data, we've got to, we got to capture, curate, and share the data so that our mission partners uh, and our joint service partners can get access to it. So we gotta think about the problem differently. That's my two cents. The last thing I'll say on that is, and I may be a little biased, um, but the Air Force's role in the mission partner environment um, I think is gonna be key. And I met an amazing individual last night who we had a, a discussion with who is eager to understand the combatant commander requirements and is eager to put that into the program and, and, and make sure that, that that program moves out. So I think, um, while it may not be exactly one, uh, one and the same, I think that the, the great things that that individual is going to be doing is, uh, is, is well worth uh, the future coming forward. So. Thank you. Uh, the next question for the panel. Does our over-reliance on technology as a key enabler to maintain decision superiority leave our commanders vulnerable in conflict where our use of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum is contested. Hey, Witt, you want to come up here and answer that? <laughs> we got the joint spectrum manager or commander sitting here in the audience. Okay, I, I, I was cute. To, I was I was cute to be the guy for embarrassing silences. So, I think um, so. Um, when I took over uh, my my job, we were cleaning it. We were looking in safes, and we found a we found a command history of Pacific Fleet in Six Directorate from December eighth, nineteen forty one, to August twelfth, nineteen forty five, and uh, we're working with a. a uh, Navy historians to get it declassified, but they're, you know, read it with fascination, double space type document, and they talked about, they talked about when the war started, they, they, they had technology in their hands that they hadn't really quite figured out how to use, and at the time they thought it might be important, and they realized as they went along that they needed to, they really needed to, to figure out how to deal with it, and, and bring it into the fleet, and it was called radar. So I think uh, all of us as technologists feel a responsibility to, um, to understand and to make sure that, that we, we build the best system that we can to, to prevent people from relying on that. Uh, I, I think that, 
I, I would say, I would say, I don't look at it as over reliance on technology. I, I see it as a fact of life. I think we're, we're we're facing adversaries who are informationalized, and we have to counter that. I think we're facing adversaries who realize, in the past, that they've studied our performance in past conflicts, most recently, and they keyed in on the fact that it's one of it's actually one of our strengths. So it it, it goes back to the, a couple of previous questions about to recognize the fact that we're going to be contested in this environment and, and be prepared for it. And that, that starts with training. I mean, it's, it's, it's way more than just technology. I think we've all talked about it. It's about training. It's about structuring our tactics. It's about anticipating and planning for that and, and for having layered effects that we can bring to bear. But you can't, I think we can't ignore it. I mean, the, but we have, to, we, we have to understand it. We have to train for it uh, like we do. And, uh, we're, we're lucky. Uh, it's interesting in the Navy where our, our new CNO, as everyone knows, was the commander of Fleet Cyber Command. So we're, we're, we're positioned there. I think what we don't realize is that how much our, our senior commanders know this. I've, I've worked for, I've been blessed to work for a lot. I've, I've, I think I've, I've been benefited in a master class in command and control. And, and they all they all understood it. They all understood. They understand its strengths and its weaknesses, and they they build it into their tactics. Um, you know, for you know, we're we're going into you know the next fight's going to be a maneuver is is going to be maneuver warfare, uh, like we did like we did in the Second World War, and we're going to have to maneuver in space and cyber the same way. And I think it's mastering that maneuver capability is is how we're going to how we're going to deal with how we're going to be contested. So, I'll take it. Um, so I would say that um, there are other inputs. I, cer certainly, I think as a service and, and as a community, as a military community in the U.S., we are certainly relying upon technology and we traditionally observe a technological adva advantage. But, you know, there's the art piece of war. And, and you have to consider the experience of our leaders. And at the end of the day, uh, our new, we have a new commander at USAPEC, General LaCamera, I, I believe, has the most deployed time of any commander or senior leader in the, in the service at this point. And so at the end of the day, if we were in a degraded environment, my expectation is that his instincts would uh, actually prevail and then he would give us guidance and direction. I certainly don't think that any leader would sit and be completely uh, stifled by the lack of availability of a certain asset. And so at the end of the day, I think that um, there's an awareness in terms of the space that you're in and, and you follow your gut at those times and you make a decision and, and the art of war takes over in that time frame. So it's always good to have availability. That's where the six community comes in and our job is to provide, again, uh, access, whether degraded, uh, some means of communication to get the message through. But you're, you're also taking input simultaneously from multiple spaces and you put that picture together and if one area is degraded, you have some instinct that takes over and you'll give guidance, that leader will give guidance and, uh, and they'll move forward and we will be successful. And I think historically when you look at it, some items that, um, I think the, some of the missions that you saw where people write stories about them, even make movies, is a result of a leader on the ground um, assessing the environment and moving forward and it's not necessarily based on a technology that was available or not available. Kind of hard to add to that. Well, well done. Yeah, great answer. So I was just going to say, commander's intent. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I I would just say that it's mutual. I mean, what affects us affects the enemy. We we don't ever stop thinking about it. I was going to elaborate on the point that we're not ignorant to this. It's very easy to become over reliant on any any piece of technology, but but it's something that we incorporate in all of our planning. If I go back, if, if I did a technology timeline all the way back to my second lieutenant days. There's a reason why we did HF shots. There's a reason why we embraced EHF. There's a reason why we, and, and I'm not going to get too much into current te uh, technologies, but there's a reason why we constantly practice this. We constantly plan for this. We do, you know, I remember in the um, early 2000s, the big buzzword was operations without space. And we were all planning, at least I thought it was from a Marine Corps perspective, but we were all planning, uh, like Mr. Stevenson was saying, how do we do this? How do we... How do we plan around this? What, what does a day without space look like? And I know there was a lot of uh, 
a lot of our corporations that were involved in helping us do those operations, especially in this theater, when we could try to figure out what, what does maneuver warfare look like when you don't have certain bands of satellite available to you. We did that very recently using the Joint Spectrum Center when we were doing planning in this theater. And we immediately went to them to get different shots of different land masses to see what we were and were not capable of doing in this theater or what would happen if we lost certain capabilities, certain satellites. And with that, a lot of that information went back to industry. Uh, you may have not known specifically the details of what we were looking for, but you knew generally the capabilities that we were looking for. If we were buying up sa satellite bandwidth based on a threat that was very public, that was in the news, you knew exactly what we were looking at. So we, we absolutely are over-reliant on technology, but we're constantly training for that worst-case scenario, what, what happens when things do go bad and we do lose our access to the spectrum. Uh, final thought I, I would say is you know, c conflict is complex, right? And, and the goal is how do you create multiple dilemmas uh, for your adversary to put you in a positional uh, advantage? And whether that's technology, whether that's geography, or anything in between. And so I think that's um, our professional development, I think, is second to none. And that puts, as Lisa said, that puts our leaders in position to understand the complexities and understand those potential di dilemmas and to, to make the right decisions with the multitude of, of, of input from, from, from staffs and, 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 and operational commanders. So I think that's what, um, I think that's what overcomes. Um, and, and I'd offer, are you over, anytime you're over-reliance on anything, that, that puts you at a, at, a, a, at a potential advantage. But there's things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's exercises that we do, whether it's the, the leveraging of the technology and having the, the technology be more resilient than it was two years ago, three years ago, puts us in, in a positional advantage. Thank you. The next question is for Mr. Stevenson. Even if we dramatically change the acquisition timeline, <laughs> could we fiscally afford to keep up with the pace of technological change? Well, um, it's a good question. So I, th I think um, I think the answer is. Uh, you know, we, um, we, we find ourselves in a position um, sometimes where we've got to look at the leading edge versus the bleeding edge. And uh, I'm, I'm, I would be the first person to hold my hand up and say, uh, I've, 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 I've lived on the bleeding edge and, and, and we paid for it. Um, Navy, um, we first started putting networks on, on ships. The leading technology at the time was, was ATM to the desktop. We all went to we all we, we went to, uh, with Admiral Clemens to live in Washington, and we were told that Windows NT would be delivered ATM native, and we should we should make the investment in ATM. And it turned out not to be, and it, uh, we paid for it, uh, it uh, dramatically. We uh, we were just getting to the point where we got. Once you, once you make a big decision like that, it's not an easy one to back out of, especially on ships. So um, can, we, can we physically afford to keep up with the pace? Of, I, I, I believe the answer to that question is yes, though, having said that. But I think, it, it, I think a lot of it has to do with, with how we acquire stuff. And I'll, I'll talk about something mundane, uh, base infrastructure. Uh, you, you read you read my thing. I'm and, and like all of us here, we're all we're all sixes and we're also CIOs. And uh, you know we have uh, I, I, we have uh, uh, I, I own bases. I'm responsible for bases, Navy bases that basically start um, just west of the Mississippi River and go all the way to Diego Garcia. Uh, with with cable plants that are that I would describe politely as elderly, and since I'm, I'm, I'm in that category, I have to be genteel. But, you know, we could spend, we figured out if, if, you know, if we took sort of a traditional approach to how we acquire it, it would cost about as much as an aircraft carrier to replace, to go in and replace all the inside and outside cable plants. Uh, I, I, if I were to advocate that in front of my, my boss, I would then walk out of the office and go start packing up my desk to leave. But I, I think that partnering with industry that this is an example. If we partner with industry, we could we could leap over technology and give our sailors and airmen 
the network they need uh, and not not do it at great expense. I think it's, it's how we acquire, how we partner with industry, how we take advantage. I, I, think, it, I think it has to be measured. I think I'm a big believer in risk reduction. Um, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, I, you know, I, I, sometimes I, I, was a, I was a science advisor to the Joint Support Force in Japan. Uh, when I left, the, uh, the staff gave me a special patch it was a picture of Tinkerbell with a line through it. I was called the, uh, the, the good idea fairy killer. Um, <laughs> experimentation is important. I mean, you can, you can go back through history and find all examples of, 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 of experiments. You know, we're, we're trying to work together with, pe with partners like DARPA, like the Strategic Capabilities Office, like uh, leverage work being done in our... Uh, University affiliated research centers and our, our service labs and with industry to do that. I think, uh, I, I, think, I think it's our duty to figure out a way to make this affordable solution because at the end of the day, we, you know, we're, we're asking the American taxpayer <laughs> to give up their treasure uh, and, and we're expected to protect the lives of their sons and daughters. And I, think, I think it's a you know, I, I think I would turn the question around and say it's a mandate that we have to do that. We have to figure out a way to do this more, more efficiently. I would much rather take every, you know, focus every dollar on, on buying capability uh, wherever I can. But uh, I think, uh, so I think, I think there are ways, there are ways to do that. I think, you know, focus, focus experimentation leading to risk reduction, leading to early prototypes. I marvel sometimes at how fast our adversary seems to be able to take our ideas and turn them into operational systems. And I think we have to figure out how they're good at it and, uh, and, 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 and match that. Um, but you can look at, I mean, I mean, you can look around what, I look to what, what American industry is doing to technological challenge and 5G and getting us into space. Uh, in education, I think we have to we have to leverage that. So, I would say, could we? Uh, I, I think I think we have to. We have to do that. But we have to do that to realize that we're not going to have uh, we're not going to have PhD computer scientists forward in the field. We have to build things. We have to figure out. We need your help, all your help to to engineer the complexity. Uh, out of that, I, I, was, I was a political science major. Uh, I learned how to operate a nuclear reactor. Uh, I think we got to, uh, we need to figure out how to, we owe it, we owe it to our, our soldiers and sailors, airmen and marines to, to, to give them capability that they can, it's not going to fail them and it's not going to bankrupt the country to do it. The other thing, uh, the only thing I'd add is, um, uh, actually, two things. I, I think part of this also is, is a whole of nation aspect, right? A, a, as we look at, at technology, let's take quantum computing for example. If you look at some of some some other nations, I mean, they're putting billions and billions of dollars into quantum computing center of excellence, and and, and centers of, of excellence. Um, they have they are nationally invested in that technology, as well as others. Um, we, have to do, we have to do the same thing, and then we as a de department have to be able to leverage that, leverage some of that R&D um, to, to make our, our capabilities uh, that much better. The, the, the other part is, to, and to get to Mr. Stevenson's last point, is the complexity of the technology and the complexity of the capabilities and the offerings from, from industry. I, I think there's a change in the model. Um, I, see, I see some change occurring, but maybe not as, as rapidly. It's, if you're providing capabilities, that also require a significant sustainment tail of operators and administrators and engineers, um, which used to be a good model five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, that, that's not the model that, that we need today. We, we need the technology that our forces are able to, um, without having to go through five, six, seven, eight years of training to master some of those capabilities. That, that, that's what we need. We need that type of technology. Um, and also we need, I'll offer, we need less technology and less products. Um, those who've heard me talk previously, 
you've heard me say many times, if, you know, if you're going to bring me a capability, then tell me what four, what four tools and what four systems and what four capabilities that I can remove. Um, because we have a bunch, and there's, a, there's an effort going on within the Air Force today <coughs> called 12 and 12, um, which from a cybersecurity and defense standpoint, we're trying to get down to, the Air Force is trying to get down to 12 tools and capabilities within the next 12 months, because right now it's above 40. With, oh, by the way, 200 different instantiations of those 40 tools and, and, and capabilities. It, it's kind of gone way out, way out of whack. We've, we've kind of lost our way because a lot of things have been so piped. So the integration of that and bringing, bringing that together, I think, is very important. And from an industry standpoint, asking for your help, from a complexity standpoint and from a sustainment and logistics standpoint, to, if, we can, if we can reduce that, then it makes it more physically palatable in the end. One of the things I'm, I'm going to add is in on, <clears throat> I mentioned the Commandant's planning guidance. Right, right now, the time is very ripe. In the planning, planning guidance, he mentions that our focus is on 3 meth and the indo pacom pacing threat. That's a very clear and specific uh, direction that the Commandant is taking the Marine Corps. We're abandoning, uh, we're willing to say that we're not only going to fight as a MAGTAP, something that we've stood by for years, for decades. So we are changing dramatically as well as looking at ways to affect the acquisition timeline. I mentioned earlier that we're looking at divesting in capabilities that have been our bread and butter for years. If you read that Commandant's planning guidance, you will see key capabilities that will enable us to really take that money that we're saving. And the, the question says, will we be able to keep up fiscally? Fiscally, yes, we will because we're going to focus in on capabilities that matter based on the threat that we're facing. You'll see some of, the, some of the capabilities are like uh, tanks. We're doing away with tanks. We're doing away with the COC, the Combat Operations Center. One of the things I was going to ask for from industry is we're doing away with our investment in the Joint Battle uh, Command platform. So we're looking at more ways to be more agile and deliver new capabilities that will allow us to have that PNT or that PLI capability. Right now, I, I mean, this is a big issue for the Marine Corps. We, we are looking at ways to move faster through the acquisitions timeline and get capabilities that will, that will help us with that current threat. The Army and the Navy, uh, they could very well bring us back full circle, but we're trying to look at what is industry providing right now. The Army, as of yesterday I looked, the Army is investing about $44 million in, um, in JBCP. The Navy is about $22 million. So they're still going in that direction, but we're trying to dramatically change the direction we're going with this commandant. And uh, as I said before, with our naval integration over the next three years, we're going to see some dramatic changes. So uh, as far as keeping up fiscally, I think we'll absolutely be able to do it. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question is for uh, General Skinner, and it begins with a little bit of exposition. Um, so as the fir uh, former 24th Air Force commander, and in light of what I hope is a faithful paraphrase of some comments Mr. Stevenson made on uh, the IA risk management framework, reduce paperwork, take credit for work completed, simplify fielding cyber capabilities, we seem to be pointing at IA policy as a major source of drag. Uh, if you concur with this comment, uh, what steps do we take to improve speed of fielding cyber capabilities as we may struggle against IA policy? Oof. Okay, um, so uh, I'll say a, a couple of thoughts. Um, those who have never met uh, Lauren, Lauren Knossenberger, uh, she's the innovation officer for the, for the Air Force. Um, she is putting a, I'll put war in quotes, because we, we, sometimes we, we overuse that term, uh, on, on policies and things that are stopping us from, from being more effective and efficient. And she's trying to get act at um, an ATO in a day. Um, now, there, there's some things that, that, that go along with that. And as Mr. Stevens talked about, the, the over a thousand security controls or a thousand controls that we have with our policy, um, they're also working to where, what are the kind of the 30 to 40 maybe um, controls that are really important, you know, continuous monitoring, um, although continuous monitoring with some of the very older systems may break those systems, but that may not be a bad thing either. Um, what are, the, what are the, the things that we really want to get after and understand? Where's the reciprocity? Where's the inheritance? that I would say the, the policy and the guidance isn't necessarily the problem there. It's the authorizing officials and actually leveraging that technology and being risk 
managed versus risk averse. Um, because in today's day and age, no matter what we do, and no matter what operations we, we uh, engage in, there's going to be risk. Um, and so, but how do we best manage that risk? And I think there's, there's a multitude, of, so it's not just the high policy, there's a multitude of things that can, that can come together, and, and they're attacking this under, under Mr. Marion's leadership. From an Air Force standpoint, and I know that the, that the other services are doing, um, doing similar uh, initiatives to, to get after that. Um, and where policy is in, inhibiting us, then we're going after the policy. Uh, now, there's some things in law that, that we talked about earlier that uh, you can't change law unless you, uh, or you can't go against law, you can try and change it or, 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 or try and get it changed. But from policy standpoint, we, we, are, we are going after that. So I think that, that's the big thing that, that we're working. Uh, I, and I will tell you, I, I am the risk management framework. The framework isn't as bad as the four letter word that people think RMF is. It's the actually how we have implemented and how we have and how we are executing it um, is really the, the the bigger issue. Now, th now there are some changes that, that we can leverage, but it's those 30 to 40 controls that we really want to get after that really give us a better sense of understanding of the risk and not just a paper that's put on the shelf that every one year, if you have an interim, or every three years if you have an ATO, that you that you reupdate. How can you leverage technology to provide the the, the network mapping that can provide the constant um, scanning for vulnerabilities, the constant and even remediation of those vulnerabilities from an automated standpoint. That's really where I think we can really make our money because if we have those in place, um, I think then the AOs will be less, uh, less risk averse um, and, and we, can, we can implement the, the policies as they were originally written uh, and originally intended to be done. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next question is for the full panel. In order to create increased resiliency in today's cyber threat landscape, how do you plan to leverage commercial SATCOM into your respective enterprise architecture? Do you envision leveraging non-geo SATCOM assets? Yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I think, I think, First of all, um, you know, we've, we've, we've gone down this path uh, to leverage commercial, commercial satellite capabilities um, pretty extensively. One of, the, one of the most interesting ways, I, I, talked, about, I talked about teleports. Um, so Navy invested in, in, commercial, in commercial capacity to gain access to teleports in the Southern Hemisphere. Because you know that basically it, it, it's it's a it, it's good from uh, uh, going against weather because you're in, you're in, if you're uh, if you're looking at a if you if you need a satellite earth station in the Western Pacific, Australia and New Zealand are in different different seasons than than Guam and Okinawa. They also conveniently happen to be out of MRBM range, so that's a that's a plus for us. I think. Um, as, as we as we go into commercial satcom, the, the challenge we face from the Navy is that that we compete fiercely for topside real estate on, on ships. Uh, it's it's very difficult for us because we have to think about mundane things like like weight and balance, but we also have to worry about radar cross section, and where the you know where missile exhaust goes when weapons are fired and stuff like that. So it's it's it's. Uh, it's a challenge for us. It's a challenge for us to go in and, and do something that requires to put new or additional satellite terminals on ships. It takes us longer. It takes uh, the issue with the fleet is that, you know we run we have a we have something called the Fleet Readiness Program FRP. It's a sequence where ships go through uh, maintenance and then and then training and workup and then they deploy and then when they come back from deployment they have to be ready to surge again. Uh, it means that if I introduce a new capability in the fleet that requires topside work, it has to be done in a public shipyard, and it means that it's going to take me about four or five years to make it happen. So we'd like we're trying to use look, use commercial systems that can leverage in investment in antennas that we have. Um, one of the things we're we're trying to look at is uh, a concept coined by one of my one of my friends called future proof. And that's software-defined radios because we find ourselves if we're if we're trying to engineer exquisite capabilities into the radios, if we do it in hardware, 
Um, that means if, if we need, if whatever capability we have in that waveform goes away, we have to install a new radio, more time, more money, et cetera. Um, Non-geo satellites are a challenge for us because if, you're, if you want continuous capability, you have to have multiple antennas or you have to have something that's more, more omnidirectional. Um, I think we're looking, we're looking at them closely. We're, there's a lot of work being done in densely populated LEO constellations that we think is gonna be a big opportunity for us. We have to overcome the challenges. We, we're, we're looking at commercial standards for modems, uh, a lot of people, when you when you go into SATCOM, it's like, it's not only lease my channel, it's buy my radio, that buy my radio gets in that modernization thing. I, I'd like to have something as I'd like to use, use my radio on your constellation, just so I can use it faster. Uh, I, I think, um, so I, I would say, I would say we're, we're, we're looking, we're looking closely at it. Uh, there are a lot of other capabilities I can't talk about here. Uh, capabilities and restrictions. Um, comms on the move is an interesting problem for us, especially when the thing that's moving is a submarine. So your antenna has to fit inside a pressure, a pressure-proof radon that can stand um, collapse de or crush depth pressures on a, on a ship. So that restricts us. Um, but we're 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 watching the investment. Uh, what what's going on commercially with great interest? We think there's certainly a place for it. Uh, especially, and it goes back to that thing about capacity and the ability to surge. Um, I think as, as we begin to concentrate military power in certain areas of the world, we'll, we'll need more capacity. And I'm trying to figure out how do we buy it because we, com we compete for that commodity on the global economy. I'm mindful of the fact that, you know, well, it's going to happen again next summer. The Olympics are going to happen in Japan. We're going to be competing against the major global media market for bandwidth on those satellites. Um, it, I, I first saw it when they, when we had the Sydney Olympics, I think in 2000. It was like, well, I'd like I'd like my uh, commercial wideband satellite program, please. Yeah, that just cost that cost a lot more money than you paid for it two months ago. Was like, what happened? NBC bought all the bandwidth for the Olympics. So we'll see. I mean, but I think. I think we're watching it. I think this is one of those areas where, again, we hope to leverage uh, R&D investment by industry and capacity. Uh, but we have, to, we have to balance that against some of the unique problems we have. A lot of people come to me and say, well, we do this on a cruise ship. And I remind them that cruise ships don't go, don't go, don't go below the surface for 12 hours at a time. Cruise ships don't turn into the wind every two hours to launch and recover aircraft. And, and some of the things we do, and, and we're not shooting, we're not rotating, ro you know, radiating a large, powerful S-band radar right next to their antennas. But we're uh, we're very interested in that. So we're doing this quite a bit, especially with the UAV community. We're seeing that we have the tactical. I, I've seen so many uh, examples where the tactical dishes are set up right beside the commercial ones. And it's very tough to com compete with what the commercial uh, SATCOM assets, the COM SATCOM, what it brings to the table. The footprint is lighter, the speed is faster, the, the support is easier and, and, until we get into that deployed environment. Or until we're up against a host nation agreement or we're competing with the same 5G spectrum that the host nation might, be, uh, might also be competing in. So absolutely, we always plan for commercial SATCOM. Uh, across all bands, not just GEO, but MEO and LEO. We've done extensive planning, we've, we've done extensive contracts in AO, and some of them, some of them have materialized. Um, this is very prevalent in Southwest Asia. Some of them over here are a little bit more challenging. We have, uh, again, the host nation agreements continue to challenge. So it's not that we don't want to. We will use them wherever they can be used, wherever they, they always prove to be more effective than the tactical solutions. But sometimes we have to rely on the tactical solutions and tactical bands just based on where we're operating at that time. I, I would encourage industry to look at an untapped resource that we, we haven't really talked much about is how do we operate in the noise floor of the spectrum? Uh, during my time as an Air Force fellow out, out, out at Idaho National Labs, they've developed a capability where they can, they can stealthily operate in the noise floor when they set up a uh, wireless or cellular network. 
and they can push data rates, uh, pretty high data rates up in the high megabits uh, to do that. So at, as industry, as you guys look at helping us with developing new capabilities, we, we, need, to, we need to begin to focus on that untapped resource. In terms of the Army, I mean, certainly same challenges, right? So we're looking at the resiliency that commercial satcom provides, uh, but certainly we also have the same challenges. There's really no different argument from anyone else on the table. Thank you. So I think it's a, it's a resounding yes that, uh, you know, commercial satcom is, is an imperative part and an integral part to, to future operations. I'll tell you, if you look at, at what is going on from a commercial state space stamp standpoint, and the, the number of constellations and number of satellites within those constellations for, for commercial SATCOM, it's just going to be enormous uh, over the next 10, 10 to 15 years. And, and our ability to leverage that um, is going to be key. And I'd offer from a terminal standpoint, I think that's where the, the, the key is going to be, is, is how do you have a terminal that can access all these different capabilities and all these different constellations um, uh, it is going to be key in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one more question, so this will be the last one. Uh, it's also for the full panel. What needs to be done to bring all elements of national power together to take on the adversarial challenge that has been highlighted in this conference? <laughs> Here, here's a, yeah, I'll start and then I'll, Over I'll, you, let, the, Lisa. I'll let them go. The, um, um, I think we're on the way. Um, if you think about it, the national defense strategy has emboldened and brought all the services, all the combatant commands together towards a, a single strategy. Uh, it's not perfect, but uh, th those who heard me talk at the SIF, you know, this national defense strategy is something that every single service chief and every single combatant command had input in through the entire time. And so every single one of them, I mean, this, this is their, their national defense strategy. And if you look at the budget decisions that are going on, whether you agree or disagree with all of them, um, most of those budget decisions are aligned to that national defense strategy and how the services, organized training and equipping, and how the, even the combatant commander requirements are all focused on how do we get after this national defense strategy. Resources will never be enough. Uh, we understand that and we realize that. But there are fundamental shifts in the services and the things that they are funding to get after the national defense strategy. So I think we are, we are well on the way uh, of bringing all this together and all the elements. The thing that I think we'll, we will continue to work on is how do we partner with, uh, with the rest of the nation, right, either from an interagency standpoint and from a national standpoint and also from a coalition standpoint so that we can make the most effective use of what everyone brings to, to that fight so that we're not duplicating um, and, and we're not having gaps in, in getting after the national defense strategy. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to pile on with General Skinner. I think if you look at, at, at the national defense strategy and, and how Admiral Davidson's strategy and the service strategies are all nested underneath it and they recognize the existential threat that this new, great power competition poses to the United States. I think if you were here yesterday, you heard uh, Admiral Studeman um, what his his you know his his me, you know the strategic messaging that needs to go on, I think those of us that live in this environment every day were not surprised by what he said, but by surprised at you know what he what he laid out in in public. And, but I think I think it is a unique unique time, and we are seeing we are seeing the whole of government line up behind this, uh, especially especially within the department, but but even outside the department. Which is which is good. Um, I'm, and we're seeing some things in, in terms of authorities that are being uh, that are being uh, granted to uh, some of the functional combatant commanders, which are are overdue in my opinion. So I think it's one is to continue to um, to communicate, uh, communicate again. Always important. Tell what tell the story on the threat. Uh, tell the Communicate without being alarmist about what it what it potentially could do to us. It's a whole of government thing, uh, but I think I think the country's moving the, the country's moving in the right direction on this issue and needs to needs to need to continue that focus. And it's it's incumbent upon all of us 
to work to the best of our abilities to go after this problem. I mean, I think nobody, nobody in this room and this table wants to fight this fight, but also nobody in this room wants to lose it if we have to. <clears throat> I, I was asking the J6 in general if I should just close out my comments anyway. <clears throat> I felt like I was at the War College again when I saw that question. Very <laughs> challenging. Um, <clears throat> I won't address the question. I think the J6 and uh, Mr. Stevenson has addressed that adequately. I do, I do want to throw a challenge out the industry, and I want to begin just by thanking you for your continued commitment to DOD and the excellence you provide to your, your individual products, your individual services. It's very evident. And I do, I mean, we all rely on you heavily to continue to do what you do. So thank you for making that commitment. Also, there's a lot of things that we can all say we need. I was joking earlier about having a list. I really do. I think we all do because we have challenges we face every day that we're not well suited to do. We're war fighters. We're not, we're not technologists by design. But one of the things that I'm particularly challenged by, if you are in the I.O. or the Intel field, you might be familiar with the I.E., Information Environment Running Estimate. On the cyber side, we've been, we've been playing around with a cyber cop for years. Um, we, we still aren't there. We're not even close. We have different elements. If you, if you sit where uh, General Skinner used to sit at JFAQ, Doden, you've seen a pretty decent picture. He might disagree. But from here, it was extremely bad. We don't have a regional cop on just the technological side of the IRCs that I was talking about earlier, the, the C4 side, the, the cyber side. When you integrate all those human elements on the other side that I talked about, the information-related capabilities, we are far from that. So I do not have an, a, a COP, an information-related COP, or a combined information overlay that I can show my boss. We are doing that in, in a very pathetic way, and we call that an IE running estimate. There's a lot of man hours that go into that. Some of you all that provide, that play in the data analytics world, that play in the IA world, AI world, I, I talked to you all about that while, while I walked the floor. I need your help with that. I need a combined information overlay that takes all those technical related, information related capabilities, combine them with all the human elements on the other side of the information related in, uh, capabilities and provides us with that entire picture, that entire cop. So that's what I'll leave you with. Again, thank you for your support. Uh, I'll be at Marfor Pack for hopefully at least another year and a half or so. And I look forward to meeting with you all. Thank you. All right, well, I'll close with this. Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out a term here, but w within PACAF, we're, we're evaluating opportunities to leverage digital, the digital Air Force initiatives. Some of you may have heard about what those are, uh, but, but to improve or seed our joint and coalition warfighting as a service commodities uh, to make them more interoperable. One of those initiatives is what we're calling Pacific Network. And really, it's about all the services not just the Air Force, but as the Air Force, how do we seed that effort in order to make it more joint and interoperable? So one of the challenges we're looking to address first and foremost is how do we bring together all of those separate active directory forests on CIPRANET? How do we collapse all those active directory forests so that we can, op we can operate and fight from a single active directory forest where all our mission systems can work, they're, they're interoperable, uh, today, that's a big challenge. Every exercise we go into, as Mr. Stevenson mentioned, out, mentioned, he's been through many of them, and we, we find it hard to communicate just across our chat services. Uh, I mean, we, we have instances where we stand up a Jace out at Makalapa, which is literally two, less than two miles away from our AOC, and he has less bandwidth capability than our Jace that's set up out on one of their ships in the Pacific. That's unacceptable. So how do we do that? That's one of our basic needs and challenges, and that's what I'll close with. General Skinner mentioned in the beginning when he talked about theft of intellectual property. And so the one point I'd like to leave with you is we enjoy working with industry. We embrace uh, innovation, um, but we need to continue to emphasize security. Security from the perspective of if you think about what we need in terms of enabling convergence and support of all domain operations, we need to modernize. We need to have uh, infrastructure improvements. We need to get uh, through acquisition a lot faster. 
But when we have the theft of intellectual property as a result of poor security practices and, and lack of emphasis on that, what we ended up doing is actually giving our adversaries uh, peer, uh, peer ability to have the same capacity capability that we have. And so I'll leave with you that we have traditionally enjoyed a technological advantage. Uh, I think that's a foundational premise behind how we approach uh, war fighting. Uh, certainly we will adjust in an environment where uh, technology is, is degraded or certainly sometimes unavailable. But if we continue to place emphasis on security throughout and, and emphasize that, then we will continue to enjoy the technological advantage that we need so that we can provide superior information, information superiority. And so I really enjoy working with everyone. I've certainly embraced a lot of the innovative concepts. And I think that we'll be, we'll be able to implement those uh, in support of USAPAC operations and mission command here in theater. Um, but please uh, I'll continue to emphasize security and protecting the, uh, the innovation that you're building for us so that our adversaries aren't using the same technology in the same space. So thank you. I didn't get to realize I, I, I should have brought my list it is Christmas. Um, I, I, and I, I would, everything that my colleagues mentioned at the table, I think we all, we all can use, and, I, and we do intend to partner to get, work together in the coming year to, uh, to, to try and realize that. I think, um, I would ask, I would, uh, it's hard to say so many things, uh, so many things, but I, I would like to echo this idea about Protecting, protecting the intellectual capital of our nation. It's, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's critically important. We have to figure out a way to do it so that it doesn't, when we don't do that by making you surround your, your offices with piles of paper, but take concrete security measures to protect access to your information. Uh, it, is, it is unclassified. We do, uh, we do all of our acquisition unclassified. Our, 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 our budget plans are public record. But I, I think we have to we have to think long and hard about how we protect that protect that advantage because it will be um, you know I, I, I worry about it a lot. I also I also worry about what can we do to protect the other key elements of our society. Um, you know things like electrical power distribution, banking, medical records, food distribution, uh, you name it. I think something I would. On top of all that other stuff, I'd like to see a, a concerted national effort to pre prepare the nation for what I could be a really big threat. Um, so if I were asking for one thing, that's what I'd ask for, that and a Porsche Cayman, preferably white. <laughs> Every year I ask my wife for that and I get one that's about this big. But seriously, thanks. You know, thanks everybody for the great work you're doing. Um, we. We together, we at this table think of ourselves as one team. We look at this room and think of it as one team. And uh, we need everybody's best effort as we go forward in this effort. Thank you. I just want to th thank the panel members for, for their time today. Thank you for, for being part of this. And more importantly, thank you for being partners uh, with us as, as we continue to move forward. I hope everybody has a great day. Thanks.